each year since 1932, the British Schools Exploring Society has sent some 60 boys of 17 to 19 years old from schools, industry and cadet forces on pioneering expeditions to remote parts of the world. This film shows some of the boys and their activities. What will they learn? I'm not sure, honestly. Well, meeting and making friends with new people. I hope for adventure, but what, I don't know. My new boots are killing me already. I suppose we'll learn something, even if it's only about ourselves, or the people we're living with. I wonder if my constipation will matter. With these questions yet to be answered, Hawke's Bay and the expedition area is reached by bus from the airport. The boys prepare to march the eight miles to the main camp. the main camp. This will be the base for the 60 boys and 10 leaders for the next seven weeks. The boys are divided into working groups, or fires as they're known. Each fire has an allotted task. The first job of this expedition is to set up an advanced camp eight miles away on the mountain interior from where most of the future work will be done. The red line on the map shows the route from Hawke's Bay to the main and advanced space camps. The advanced base camp is set up. The commando fire have an early breakfast. Then they prepare to march and explore possible routes for the scientists who will be following later. Botanists and surveyors start work on a peat bark. The surveyors proceed to make a map of the area using theodolites and plain table. flies are very troublesome. Their biting makes static work extremely uncomfortable. The botanists inspect the local flora. The fly-eating pitcher plant, appropriately the state emblem of Newfoundland. Elsewhere, the age of the trees in the local scrub is being determined by taking increment borings. The growth rings are counted, and some of the trees are estimated to be 100 years old, even though they're only about 12 feet high. Related information is later sent to the Canadian Department of Forestry. The blue lines on this map show the 90 miles covered by the botanists and surveyors. The 
entomologists collect beetles by sweeping, by grubbing under rocks, leaving not one of the proverbial stones unturned, or by looking in the most likely places, such as dung. The beetles are asphyxiated, packed, and eventually about 7,000 beetles and a thousand other insects are sent to the London Natural History Museum. The red lines on this map show the area covered by the geologists. Rock samples are collected by small groups from the geology fire. These samples are marked and packed to be sent to Cambridge University for radioactive dating. Sketch maps made from aerial photographs will be used in later investigations and samples of river silt are sent to a local mining concern for mineral analysis. During all this time, Chief Leader Tom Dean and Assistant Chief Leader Derek Jackson keep in touch with parties in the field using portable VHF radio links. This composite map shows all the areas covered by the expedition. How do the participants feel about the expedition now? The early rising and food, or lack of it, impressed me most. The rain was memorable. The flooding at the dam was fantastic compared with its normal level. I was always thinking about food. It was surprising how often it came to mind. Marching made me tougher and more self-reliant. Also, it was the only way to get anywhere. It makes you realize what you can do. I began to appreciate how ants must feel. Care was one of the things we learnt. Of course, there were easy ways of doing things. Yes, it was great to get back to base camp, and I feel that I appreciate more now what is good food and what are the social comforts of life. I agree, the pleasures of being dry and not hungry are seldom realized.
It's a pity we did not see more wildlife. Only those ptarmigan. And they weren't worth eating. Yet, overall, it was a great experience, and at the end, when the flags were down, I was sad to leave. <laughs>